Tuesday, everybody. It's the On Texas Football Tuesday live stream uh, brought to you by Texas Electricity Ratings. Good to be with you. It's a beautiful day in Central Texas. Hopefully beautiful where you are. A little windy, but uh, bright and sunny and ready to roll here. Uh, Longhorns have had seven practices now into the spring. Sark said today today they got after it pretty good today, coming off of uh, Easter weekend off. And uh, Sark did meet the media, so we'll certainly talk about what he had to say today in a pretty short, uh, brief press availability, about 12 minutes today. Uh, we will talk about uh, the highlights and where they're going. Obviously, we're counting down the days and the practices to the spring game on April the 20th and the countdown to their Texas baseball playing right now, too. We'll keep you posted on that as we go. As we always say on a Tuesday night, good to uh, watch the ball game, turn it down, and turn up tech on Texas football and the live stream on a Tuesday night. I'm Aaron Hogan. He is Rod Babers. He is C.J. Vogel. Uh, afternoon, evening, guys. How are you? C.J., you are at the availability today. And as you said, uh, not a lot. It was in about 12 minutes. They introduced the new swimming coach. And props to UT and Chris Del Conte. You replaced a, uh, the greatest coach maybe ever in, ever in Texas athletic history mm-hmm. with another Hall of Fame coach who just won a national championship two days ago, and uh, Coach Michael Phelps. So, you know, props to CDC and the athletic department bringing in Bob uh, Bob Bauman uh, to run the swimming and diving. But that kind of shortened Sark's availability. But CJ, what were your thoughts on all that? Whatever, whatever we had just uh, threw at you. Yeah, I actually caught the, I guess, the very beginning of Coach Bowman's uh, introductory press conference with CDC and the Texas uh, uh, brass in there for his press conference. But the thing that stood out to me was, you know, he originally told Chris Del Conte in Texas now. He's like, you know what, I'm, I'm good with where I'm at. And then later on he called, uh, uh, CDC called again. He said, you know what, Coach Reese is, is officially done. You know, he's moving on. Next venture of his life, no longer be coaching Texas Swim and Dive. We need you. He goes, well, well, Chris Del Conte, let me go win a national championship first, and then I'll I'll, I'll come join <laughs> you here at the Texas uh, University of Texas. So that's exactly what he did at Arizona State last year. Ended up winning the national championship and made it out to uh, Austin today, obviously for his introductory press conference. Beforehand, we got to hear from Steve Sarkeesian just a little bit. Uh, again, seven practices in, four practices in the books in pads. Uh, Texas gearing up a little bit more for a big scrimmage this weekend in front of 30, 35 recruits or so. Uh, it, it's a big weekend. And I think right now you're starting to hear how Texas is you know, beginning to look on the field a little bit more so than the beginning of the year. Uh, Rod, you can attest to this, just kind of the progression of spring football as it goes from you know practice to practice. You only get 15 of them. So you really got to make these practices count. Sarkeesian said today was a heavy practice, uh, really physical. Uh, Thursday will be a little bit lighter as well before going, uh, I, I, I guess, balls to the wall a little bit on Saturday for some, you know, ones versus ones and, and good good versus mm-hmm. good there uh, a little bit. That'll be a lot of it uh, exciting just to hear what's, you know, some of the big storylines coming out of uh, the scrimmage on Saturday. But uh, the number one thing that really stood out to me, and I think everybody on this panel would agree, was, you know, Sarkeesian mentioned, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of these early enrollees, the the leadership necessarily hasn't clicked just yet. That's something that you get over time. Not necessarily you see six or seven practices into spring football. What is interesting, though, is Sarkeesian, you know, shouted out Ryan Wingo uh, today saying he was one freshman that really understands what it takes to be a big time player. He's caught his eye early on the side, the combination of speeds. Speed, athleticism, uh, and size is really standing out, and he's making a number of plays early on this spring. It's interesting. And, Rod, uh, before we get into the uh, the the Trey Wingo or Ryan Wingo conversation, Trey Wisner was mentioned today, the transfer portal. Let's just uh, tip our caps. And you guys are wearing caps, I'm not, to, to uh, Andy Reed. <laughs> because I mean, as I was listening to that press conference today, 46 years, 45 Big 12 or conference championships, whatever conference they were in, 15 national titles. Um, you know, he spanned Daryl Royal to Fred Akers to Steve Sarkeesian. And I, I thought it was interesting that uh, CDC mentioned today, Rod, that um, and he was there when you were playing, uh, Eddie Reese, uh, the, even after the uh, Tennessee loss or beat, beat Texas in the uh, uh, in the NCAA tournament, the round of 32, Rick Barnes, you know, CDC revealed today that Rick asked him, how are you going to replace Eddie? I mean, who's going to replace Eddie? Like well, it's yeah. something that Rick Barnes remembers, you know, because he's kind of like the for, for 40 plus years, he's been kind of the Yoda in the athletic department that he's the guy that people go to for coaching advice. And he's just been a a unbelievable, maybe the greatest leader and coach uh, the athletic department's ever seen. 
Yeah, uh, that's possible. I mean, it's uh, it's unbelievable and actually pretty extraordinary what he's done uh, throughout different decades to still maintain that level of success and that standard. That is the goal of every coach on the 40 acres. And Texas had some great Hall of Fame coaches that still haven't been able to maintain the standard uh, of excellence throughout m- multiple decades. <laughs> like Eddie Reese says, and then you talk about sending off guys to represent their country as, you know, guys who won gold medals as Olympians, in addition to the excellence of winning championships here, uh, you know, obviously in conference play and national championships as well. It is, it's remarkable. Uh, it, it, and it's uh, something that I don't think will ever be equaled. That's there's yeah. just, and, I, and that's, that's nothing against any of the coaches in any of the sports at Texas. Uh, but there's there's no equaling that. I mean, that's some <laughs> that they they don't even make them like that anymore. Coaches won't even stick around that long anymore. They won't even be given that opportunity anymore. Uh, you know, and and like I said, they they only make one um, of, of 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 that kind, like Eddie Reese. So, congrats to everything he's done, and I I'm thankful as a Longhorn that uh, he decided to represent us and represent that brand because. Uh, like you said, I don't know if there are many coaches in any sport around the country that have a better resume than Eddie Reese. <laughs> well, I mean, Nick Saban for about 15 years could say, if you if you come play for me for four years, you'll probably win a national championship, right? There you go. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Reese yeah. could say that for 45 years. 40. <laughs> That's not a bad selling point. Yeah. If you roll in <laughs> over the four-year period, you'll win a bunch of conference titles. Uh, you'll you'll win that, and then you'll probably you'll go, go swim for your country potentially, right, if you're that good. And yeah. that's that is to do that for almost half a century is un- unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I don't know what we're gonna do to honor Eddie Reese on the 40 acres. That's gonna be the question. I mean, is it a statue? Is it as simple as just make that statue somewhere? Is it is that simple? Uh, he's, he's, he's definitely a statue guy, ain't he? He's got to be. And then he's not a statue guy. Dude. Nobody gets a damn statue then. So <laughs> right. he, 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 take all the statues down if Eddie Reese don't get one. So I don't know where it's going, but yeah. I imagine somewhere close to the swim center if you can get it there. Well, and over the years, just hearing so many other coaches talking about how they would lean on. I mean, I remember Augie Greedo talking about how often he would talk to Eddie Reese and Rick Barnes would lean on Eddie Reese for how do you get your teams to peak right at the right time? How do you get them at their best right when it matters the most? And, um, you know, that, that they would all go to him to, uh, kind of, you know, it's, it's, you're just leading people and trying to, you know, get their best out of them when it matters the most. And he certainly did that. As for the press conference today, portal was something that piqued your, your interest, Rod, because one thing that's sure through seven practices and we're headed towards the spring game here on the Tuesday live stream brought to you by Texas Electricity Ratings is, uh, you know, you, you can and you've seen it, CJ, with your own eyes uh, out at the, uh, the the media availabilities and the media windows. You know, these portal guys uh, have have shown up and made an immediate impact. Uh, they fit in, um, you know, they, they work the way that they're supposed to work. And uh, Sark addressed that today, Rod, as far as, you know, you can say it when they're when they're committing. But now you've seen it for half the half a spring practice almost. And they're they're exactly what they were trying to, to you know that was the, that was the goal was to bring in guys like this that have performed on the field that are going to fit into the culture. Uh, yeah, and um, Sark keeps reiterating that the latter part of what you mentioned is probably more important uh, than the former. That they want to make sure these guys fit into the culture. He reiterated today and said, "A hey, character." is something they consider even before they can look at the talent of the individual, the character of the, of the individual to make sure that they're going to fit uh, into the culture that Texas has. And I mean, it's, it is, it, it is unique. I'll admit, I mean, we had a really good culture when I played at Texas, man, we won 11 games my last two years. We had a really good culture. Um, and I think we, we passed it down to the young guys like Michael Huff and VY and Casey Stutter and that group. And they end up winning a national title, but this culture is unique. And, 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 you know, the reason I say it's unique is because I, the leaders on our teams were, you know, they were all guys that play most of the time. They, they, they're just the, the, the leaders were the, the, the players, right? The guys that actually played and started. Uh, those were the guys who led by example and were the leaders. You know, this culture is so unique that, you know, we've seen leadership emerge from guys who are not necessarily even frontline starters for the teams, you know, like Rojo, who obviously took a back seat to Bijan in terms of starting reps and snaps on the field. But as we know, in terms of a leadership position, he was considered the, uh, you know, the culture bearer, if you will, for the team. The people look, they, the team looked to him for leadership uh, because they watched his dedication and commitment. You know, Jay Witt is that now. I I, I had a, 
a quote that I was going to get to from Jay Witt because Jay Witt did a NFL, I think it's a draft network interview uh, that he did that was really interesting. And he was talking about the culture at Texas they so proud of. He said, we take a lot of pride in saying we're the group that helped turn Texas around. Um, I was there for five years. I saw the ups and downs, uh, seeing it now, seeing how we all contributed to turn things around. It's so rewarding. He said the future is in good hands. I can't wait to see where the program goes. And he also said that um, he talked about the culture and he said, you know, it's an incredible honor um, having the respect of my teammates. He said, um, you know, I hope Texas keeps showing future iterations of the team that play he talks about that play from the TCU game. He said, I hope they keep showing that play. This is what Texas football is. We didn't have to do that. It showcases the things that happen when you have people on your team that care. We are willing to be selfless. We put the team first. Right. Yeah. And, and you can tell this is this is the culture that is being promoted and that is being, um, you know, right now that is being preached behind the scenes by the coaches and by the leaders on the team, whoever they may be. And even the guys that left, they are safeguarding that culture. You know, nothing against the young man. Was it Gus Cardova from Lake Travis and the situation that he was in? Very unique. I'm not talking about, you know, not judging uh, the situation. I'm just talking about the players like Xavier Worthy, uh, Jonathan Brooks, who were leaving the program and still felt, hey, man, that actually we don't like that fit in our culture. And it's like you guys are going to go to the NFL. But they're still concerned about the culture. They're still they're like, no, 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 man, that's something we built. And it, it means something to us. Right. That's that's part of, I think, what happened when Matt Brown was here and he built that culture where everybody felt an ownership and a responsibility to it. So guys would always come back to Texas and they were welcome back to Texas. That wasn't always the case with Tom Herman, um, you know, when Tom Herman was here. Now you've got a different culture. So I think that's really important. And, and Sark recognizes how unique it is to have guys like Jay Witt and Roshan end up being culture bearers and leaders on the team when they're not even necessarily the frontline starters or the guy that are getting all the of uh, the target share or all the snaps or all of the, the handoffs. But the team respects them because of what they've done behind the scenes and their selflessness. And I think he's he's really careful. Even the guys he's bringing in via the transfer portal, he wants to make sure they see the signs. Remember, Jeff Banks said, we got to see signs. If we don't see the signs and they're really talented, you know why we didn't recruit them, because we didn't see the signs they were going to match with our culture and fit in with our culture. That They're big on it, man. It, and I, I'm starting to believe, too, that it, that culture won them games last year. And it's going to be expected to win them some games this year. And they don't want just some – um, acquisition via the transfer portal to disturb that. Um, and, and Sark learned his lesson, right? His first year, he was bringing in guys via the transfer portal. You know, we won't name names, but y'all remember who they are. And he's like, these yeah. guys don't necessarily fit, but they're talented. And Sark learned, yeah, no, actually here in Texas, I'll get talent. I got to make sure the character is going to be on point uh, as well as the talent. Yeah. Well, and that's, uh, I pulled this from, uh, you know, people that are team culture and dynamics experts, right? And when it's elite teams, uh, there's a famous or at least a, a known commodity that, that one person's dysfunction, CJ, has five times the impact of one person's discipline. So one person can cause the ripple effect of one disciplined person. Uh, that's why you must prevent dysfunction from forming roots. And why, when it does, everyone else must elevate their discipline to put out the fire of dysfunction, which in a team dynamic of 85 scholarship players and 100 or more players, uh, you cannot let that root. And as Rod is saying, the, the players have owned it. They've seen the results of having good culture, and now they're the ones policing it. And, you know, it's you don't want to deal with, we've all been there in, in our workplace or wherever you are, family sometimes, that one person being a mess can, can lead to a, a mess for everybody that you don't want to have yeah. to deal with. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest points. E, I love that quote that you brought up as well. Uh, but one of the big takeaways I've had so far this spring is, just how often you hear different names being put up as leaders so far through winter conditioning and spring football on the defensive side of the football. I mean, you could go out and name a guy, each position group essentially and say, yeah, if, if that was the guy you asked to lead workouts, you'd feel comfortable doing it. And, and right now you look at Baron Sorrell, uh, mm -hmm. you look at David Benda, Anthony Hill, Michael Taft, I mean, Jade Baron, that alone gives you a really solid nucleus, especially with a, a, a really talented group of youngsters coming in. 
plus a Trey Moore and Andrew Makuba, Kendrick Blackshear, and Tia Savea, all joining that Texas defense, kind of getting them up to speed and up to the, uh, I would say, standard of what we've expected so far under PK on that Texas defense. So just being able to seamlessly transition from losing a Byron Murphy at the Vondre Sweat at Jalen Ford or Ryan Watts to now saying, yeah, that's okay. Uh, they were great players. They did a great job while they're here here in Austin. But in terms of what we're going to put on the field on this side of the ball, we're going to be okay. And I think that's going that that's going to trickle down into you know when it's time for Manny Muhammad, uh, Anthony Hill, Colton Vosick to step up. Those guys have seen what it's like year in and year out. And now whenever it's you know their turn to become upperclassmen, they're going to step in and say, oh yeah, yeah. They had a good run, but now it's my turn to show y'all what it's like to be a Texas Longhorn on the defensive side of the ball. There's a standard to be withheld here, and I'm going to be, you know, the admiral to make sure that it, it meets that standard. And and I'll say I'll even go further and say I think their culture is was a little bit better than ours from a leadership perspective because of the guys who have been championed as leaders, like your Rojo and your Jay Witts. Now everybody on that team, they are empowered to feel, hey, I could be a leader. I don't have to be a starter to be a leader. I don't have to be, you know, the guy getting most of the targets to be a leader I or getting all the reps. I can still lead from my role and where I am and my status on the team. And I don't know if we had that type of empowerment when I played. Our leaders, like I said, were always these guys who were starters and led by example. And it, like I said, it's I think it's that may be what you're you're observing there cj is that that's why all these guys feel empowered to lead They're like no i can be a leader you ain't got it on this team you ain't got to be a starter or you ain't got to be necessarily a frontline guy to be a leader you can lead by your dedication commitment by example behind the scenes it's actually something that's pretty powerful um and i think it's having a, a huge impact yeah well i mean it's it's said that only four percent of teams are elite right and that's what you're trying to strive to I mean elite is the the gold standard and the, the closer you get to it is, is the goal. But as you said, Rod, I mean, a guy like Michael Taft comes in as a gray shirt, does it right. And he's a starter and, you know, and guys start leaving. I mean, that's when, when the coaches are rewarding that and rewarding, you know, those guys, not that he's not a good player because he really is, but, you know, comes in as a guy, under, you know, under recruited gray shirt, mm-hmm. working his tail off. Those are good examples of what you're saying that they can become leaders too. Uh, yep. Cause everybody can lead. And, you know, the point about five times the distract dysfunction, I mean, you think about it. If there's a if there's a scandal or there's an issue that happens off the field, everybody deals with it. Everybody gets asked about it by CJ and everybody at the availabilities. What do you think? What do you, you know? Everyone's got to grab that and own it. And the other way is is equally powerful if we're all pushing the same direction. And it's almost like the the Mac Brown BBs in a box quote. Is, yep. For the yep. locker room. The, you yep. know, UT as a whole, uh, the athletic department, the boosters, the the, the president. Everybody, the BBs in the box, but it feels like the the locker room BBs are being put into a box that uh, everyone can replicate. And I'd also say credit to Sark and, and his staff because it's intentional. I mean, you don't get to this level of culture without being intentional about it. As he said, it's not a, a slogan on a T-shirt or, a you know, something you put up on the wall. It, it's every day. It's all the time. And clearly it is it's something they're dedicated to. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that or at least hearing the fruits of it. We saw mm-hmm. it last year on the field with a championship and a trip to the Final Four. They're trying to take that next step. Uh, yeah. Other things that Sark said on our Tuesday live stream brought to you by Texas Electricity Ratings. Culture is one thing, but you know we combine culture with talent. Uh, it's pretty scary. Uh, and where you got young guys pushing old guys, Rod, you've been a part of that. Uh, you know the guy that, and CJ, you can speak to this. You did. You kind of over in your overview, you mentioned the Ryan Wingo comment from Sark that uh, Ryan Wingo, this guy that's showing up. We know he's a five-star player. He's out of St. Louis. Um, you know there was some talk on. Uh, you know, signing day that maybe Missouri was pushing hard and trying to bring him and whatnot. But here he is. And here we are a few few, few months later. And Sark is, is sing, singling him out as a guy. And what I heard him say today sounded like when Xavier Worthy was here uh, as a freshman, that a guy that just is, shows up. Uh, Kelvin Banks is an example, too. Uh, just mature, ready to play, knows the role uh, and is kind of kind of uh, just walking right into what we want them to do with all that talent. That's that's got to be exciting for uh, the Longhorn passing game and the Longhorn offense. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually checked in with a source close to the team after Sarkeesian's comments today, just to, you know, double check. We we don't necessarily see Steve Sarkeesian, you know, puff smoke like this about a player very often, especially this early in their tenure as a Longhorn. Uh, but I did want to double check, of course, you know, do my due diligence as a big J journalist and kind of, you know, get an idea of, 
you know, is Sarkeesian selling him short? Is he, uh, you know, sh- shooting it straight, essentially, about Ryan Winko? And the word I got back was, yeah, that kid's good. The, the kid's going to play this year. The kid is going to be uh, a really good player for the Longhorns during his time on campus. And, and what you can expect right now is a kid that is continuing to grow into, uh, I guess, his role as a Longhorn. Will he be a, a frontline starter? Maybe not right away. But I was, again, told that the kid is going to find a way onto the field. Ryan Wingo, what he's shown through seven practices so far this spring is, hey, I mean, it's tough to cover him. It's tough to keep the ball out of his his hands whenever it's thrown in his direction. And I, I know, Rob, these big, physical, fast, wide receivers were, you know, maybe not the easiest to cover back in the day. And that sure, you know lines up today when you're 6'2", 6'3", borderline 6'3", and you're running in the 10'5s or 10'6s, that's a nightmare for just about anybody. Add in a quick release and an ability to to, uh, kind of wiggle free off the line of scrimmage, and you're looking at a guy that's very difficult to cover regardless of how old you are uh, in your college career. So right now I'm I'm hearing everything behind the scenes is lining up with what Sarkeesian told us today about Ryan Wingo. That kid is going to find a way onto the field this year, and he might be that guy you expect to be uh, a, a very, very good number one by the time his his tenure is up in Texas. Yeah, I mean, simply put, he's a he's a prodigy. Uh, so I agree with everything you said, CJ. There's no doubt. When Jerry Hamilton uh, initially told me to watch his film uh, in my notes, I, I said he's a prodigy. It, it, it's a very rare you see that size with that combination of speed and agility. Um, and I, I, I saw my man Bobby say that he was the, he's the best wide receiver recruit Texas had since uh, my man Roy Williams. I actually, a couple of weeks ago on, on, on the live stream, I said, I told Jerry, I said his combination, I don't know if their, their, their playing styles are the same. I don't, I don't know if their playing styles are the same, but the combination of size, speed, explosivity, and agility um, in one package uh, that he did remind me of Roy Williams, uh, and that's and just just because you just don't see it, it's rare to get that kind of speed and that kind of size. I think he's a 10, 500 meter guy. Uh, was he six one, almost six two, somewhere around there? Um, really explosive. He's got um, what I like to call if you, if you look at it, he's got a next level acceleration. Um, when the ball is in the air, he, you would see that he's running full speed and then he can hit another gear. Um, so he's got acceleration to, uh, to the football. And I think he's a guy that when the ball is in his hands, I think he's a little bit underrated. He was returning punts in high school and he can make you miss in a phone booth. I mean, he is really twitchy with the ball in his hands too. And I think that's what they're seeing now with the pads are on. Because when the pads are on, you separate from the finesse to the physicality at practice. And that's when you see some guys start to separate. And I guarantee that he's probably, you know, making some guys miss, breaking some tackles when the ball's in his hands too. That's that's a whole nother threat that I think Ryan Wingo brings to the table. So I'm not surprised. I mean, he was one of the main reasons I said Sark will expand that wide receiver rotation uh, yeah. this season. It's, there's no doubt the circle of trust will be larger than it's ever been with the wide receivers because he's going to force his way on the field. I want to talk about that, the depth chart, as we would predict it, uh, gosh, five months away from the start of the season and even to the spring game on the re- receiver position. Uh, but, Rod, uh, as a DB who was a, uh, a student of the game, right, you studied how it, how your opponent, even when they were your own teammate in practice, how to beat them, how to win, how to compete. Uh, to, you know, to, when you say the best, you know, package and, and tools of a, of a receiver since Roy Williams – Longhorn fans on our on Texas football live stream here tonight. Uh, remember how great Roy was as the DB. Take us into that uh, mindset about what, what you know. You, you feel like you can win this way against certain guys, but when there's that combination, it makes it really, really difficult to have a game plan. Yeah, because you know most guys uh, they have a an elite trait they de- they they depend on. Right uh, with Xavier Worthy, it's his speed. Now, he's not very big. He's about 160. Uh, so, you know, if you can, I, I would I would try my best to bump and run Xavier Worthy and try to get my hands on him at the line of scrimmage before he gets going. Once that guy gets going vertically downfield, I mean, his, his, his elite trait, right, already puts you at a disadvantage. Um, and you that's, that's the way you kind of scout receivers. And, you know, God gives every 
player, you know, an elite trait that they can work with. Most of them got something elite they can work with, something they do as well, if not better than everybody else. The problem with guys like Roy Williams and Ryan Wingo is they got like three or four of these elite traits. (laughs) They got the size. (laughs) They got the twitchiness, the acceleration, the deceleration. They got elite vertical speed just to just beat you straight away. Um, And they, like you said, they got the frame so they can make contested catches if need be too. Those guys just present so many problems because then, then, like I said, Xavier Worthy, I'm trying to bump and run him before he even gets going, before he can get into his 4-2 speed. And, hell, you only got four four seconds max to try to get open in football. Hell, if I can bump and run you for one and a half of those and then you're trying to get into your route for the other second, I already won. All right? But that's better than let, give you a free release off the line of scrimmage. Uh, I remember the big body wide receiver was like, oh, man, Sloan Thomas. Remember Sloan Thomas? Loved yeah. contested catches back in the day. If Sloan Thomas, if it was a 50-50 ball, it was 80-20 with him, and he was fine with that. He would catch the ball with his body, too, a lot of the times, and let it get into his body. But he was just trying to, to big body you. He just wanted to box you out like in basketball. Um, and he was great at that, but I know how to defend that because that was his elite trait. He just used his big body in his frame. Um, BJ Johnson was great. So we're talking about Texas receivers. He was great at the um, what they like to call movement routes. So not the stop routes. Give him a post route. Give him a post corner. Give him a vertical route. And he was great because he would have these speed cuts. That's what A.D. Mitchell's really good at, the speed cut. Speed cut is you're actually uh, being able to make a cut while while you're running close to full speed um, and running right at a guy, closing that cushion and still able to make a cut in and out of a break really quickly. Um, he's great at those speed cuts. So is my man B.J. Johnson. So he was great at moving routes because he had nice straightaway speed. So everybody's got their one or two traits they're great at. But when you get guys like Ryan Wingo, they got four, five of those elite traits. It's hard to defend all of them at one time, man. So depending on how the quarterback throws the foot, football, where the ball placement is, how he wants to play it, he can beat you with the speed. He can big body you with the contested catch. He can get twitchy and get in and out of the break and accelerate away from you. They just got so many ways to beat you. And as a DB, that, that's hell, man. That's nightmare fuel. Yeah, that's, that's a whole great description, Rod. Uh, using examples too, because that's uh, you know Roy Williams. That was a that was a bad dude. Oh, uh, we man. saw him in fourth into the NFL as well with, the, with multiple teams. Uh, that's 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 a great great call. All right, so CJ, as you look at the receiver circle, as Rod calls it, circle of trust. Uh, Rod believes it's going to expand this year just because of overall talent. And this is you know Rod played at a time at Texas when it was growing into that where you know guys that, that you know who, who felt like they were starters. Couple bad practices, a little bad, bad game. All of a sudden, yep. you're sitting in the back row. All of a sudden, as Rod would describe it, uh, that that's that's fun. How do how do you scout the receiver room right now for Quinn Ewers in this passing game? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see just how that rotation gets going because it, it 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 is going to expand. They are going to have to throw more bodies out there. Uh, there's just too many guys, I think, right now that can provide for you on the field. When you look at a Silas Bolden coming in, you already have Isaiah Bond, Jonte Cook's kind of the incumbent older guy in the room. DeAndre Moore's running with that first team. We just talked about Ryan Watts, or sorry, Ryan, Ryan Wingo. And hey, I mean, we haven't even mentioned uh, Matthew Golden, who's kind of been one of the uh, you know earliest risers so far this spring for what he's been able to do. Uh, it's a really good problem to have. And Sarkeesian kind of mentioned it today, you know, yeah, we, we've got a lot of guys in that that room that are really hungry to get their snaps, get their targets, get their receptions. How am I going to find a way to get them all involved and still find the, the best guys for me on the field at the same time? Sarkeesian basically said, yeah, good thing I have a while to fig- figure that out. You know, I still have eight practices this spring multiple scrimmages in the big game, obviously on DKR on the 20th to really get an idea of who shines when the lights are on the brightest. That'll be really interesting because I, I think what we had, or at least what I had as the group coming into the spring, probably a little bit different than what it is currently. I still think Isaiah Bond is going to be your guy, but I I think you're going to hear a lot more about Matthew Golden. And I think you're going to hear as spring progresses more and more, about Ryan Wingo. So if, if those are your three, now you're looking at a very talented group behind them as well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really interested to see just again, how these guys start to separate each other from uh, the rest of the pack. Will Jonte Cook fend off a couple of these guys? Is DeAndre Moore performing well enough to stick up in that first mm-hmm. group in the slot? We'll see. But for now, I'm starting to hear a lot of buzz around Ryan Wingo, 
uh, Matthew Golden and Isaiah Bond. Yeah. And that puts a lot of stress on a defense, Rod. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a great problem to have, but man, the, the overall speed, size, combination, I mean, defensive coordinators are going to be up nights trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, last year it was JT Sanders. You talked about being the, you know, the nightmare fuel for defensive coordinators to match up. Uh, it sounds, it sounds like they're going to have multiple guys that they're going to be able to put and, and create matchups that, that you're, as a defensive coordinator, going to be un really uncomfortable with. Yeah, that's why I was, one of the things that Sark brought up today that I was happy to hear is that they're working on situational football now. So they're done. You know, spring football is mostly about the basics. You're teaching the basics, your basic coverages, your basic fundamentals, the basic concepts, right? What you believe in um, as a defense or an offense conceptually uh, and the system itself. The guys should have already soaked that in. Guys should know the system, you know, by now at least should have – uh, so a familiarity with it, at least the new guys. And now you can start getting into situations, which is what real football is, right? Red zone, uh, short yardage situations. <clears throat> he said they did two minute drill uh, as well. Uh, this, uh, I think this practice, uh, they did two minute drill. So third down, all right, money downs, that's big situationally. So Texas, to this see this this season, I don't, and like I said, we don't know exactly how the offense is going to look, who's going to end up being the um, perennial playmakers with the offense. But I will say the red zone offense is if I was a defensive coordinator going up against Texas, I would essentially build and construct my game plan just to defend them in the red zone and say to hell with trying to defend them in between the twenties. That's too damn tough. Really. I mm -hmm. will, we'll play basic. We'll play basic defense. We won't give up the big plays in between the twenties, but when I really want to start getting creative and take chances is in the red zone because last season as elite and prolific as the Texas offense was, and it was especially if you look at the personnel, they were 120th in the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone. The games they lost last season were arguably because of red zone failure, whether it be the Oklahoma game you're talking about, or you're talking about the sugar bowl, <laughs> So I'm glad that he brought up that working on the red zone. They're installing red zone already. Um, I bet, Sark, if you if you could get them in a room privately and ask them, hey, man, what's the one thing that, that haunted you all offseason long as a coach when you had those man-in-the-mirror moments, I guarantee he'd be like, effing red zone, man. What <laughs> the happened with red zone? Like, how do we have – Two first round wide receivers, a uh, second to third round tight end, first running back potentially off the board, biggest offensive line in the Big Twelve with a first rounder on there too. By the way, and Kelvin Banks and other other guys who will be drafted, including Christian Jones, and a quarterback that potentially could be the first quarterback taken off the board. How in the hell were we that bad? And, and a play caller who is a, a one among one of the best offensive minds in football. How the hell were we that bad in the red zone? It is a great mystery. It's one of the greatest mysteries in the history of Texas football. I'm telling you, it's got to be. Like how the, I'm still wondering because he didn't solve it. He didn't. He did not solve it. They had one game where they it was an outlier, and I believe there was a Texas, but there's the Oklahoma State game, uh, and when they played him in the Big Twelve title game, remember? I think they were like five or five or something like that in the red zone. Um, and that may have been the outlier, but every other game, even I think the tech game where they blew tech out, they won great in the red zone. There was always red zone issues and it came back to haunt them. And I guarantee you, Sark's trying to figure that out. So I don't know what it is. I think it was a combination of factors, multifactorial, but I'm glad they're working on it now. And to me, that's how I would defend Texas. I'm like, now nah, I'm defending you in, inside the, inside the red zone. That's where you struggle. You become dysfunctional. And that's where I have less uh area less uh field to defend and your your athleticism and all your speed doesn't matter as much it's not as advantageous because you only got so much room to work with yeah well the two losses last year were you know red zone killed you against oklahoma goal line uh and then obviously the, the season ended from the 11 yard line a couple chances against washington to the point rod is making and it was an all year long problem that we all saw and uh yeah i mean uh Will C.J. Vogel, do you think uh, it's better this year as far as, I mean, power run game may be a part of it? C.J. Baxter, you're more – because I always think teams that are great in the red zone can can just line up and maul you and push you into the end zone kind of thing. We see the Eagles do it in the NFL with the tush push and their power run game. I mean, great, great, great red zone teams typically are powerful. This should be an elite-level uh, offensive line with, with good running backs and all the speed we're talking about. 
Last year with Bijan and Roshan gone, Roshan was such a luxury at the goal line. I feel like they never really filled that that gap of the the power runner or at least the goal line running back within the you know five or six yard line. Yeah, I think I mean obviously it's going to be tough to be worse than you were a year ago. You know, <laughs> you, you were not good in the red zone a year ago. Uh, Rob, to your point, it was a big issue when the two losses Texas had on top of the turnovers that Texas had uh, in that game as well, whether it be going in or coming out of their own uh, red zone. But but this year I'm, I'm looking at it because I think you have a, a, a more unique set of skill players hmm. to use at your disposal. And maybe that's an issue for Sarkeesian. Maybe that was where, you know, you have a guy like Xavier Worthy who can be so creative in so many tight situations. And you have a guy like A.D. Mitchell who can go up and make the big play on a, on a jump ball. Maybe that's one of those issues where you become too reliant on going to the well one too many times. Mm. I think right now with this group right in this roster, you have two tight ends. Both can prove to be threats in the in the receiving game. They offset each other very well. I think Amari Nyblack is a little bit looser in his movements than Gunnar Helm, as we've talked about on this show earlier. Uh, but you also have a number of wide receivers. You have your big body guy in Ryan Wingo. Uh, you have Matthew Golden, who's very good and made a lot of big plays last year for Houston on the underneath, where he was able to get free uh, very quickly off of the line of scrimmage. That's something that I don't necessarily think a lot of the guys on this Texas roster have proven so far. But again, it's a it's a a different skill set that is brought to the table that I think you know you're able to use to your disposal. And so I'm I'm really eager to see just how creative Sarkeesian gets with all of these weapons, as well as a CJ Baxter, a Jaden Blue. You also have a 240 pound Savion Red itching to get the ball again. Rod, yeah. you've talked about him in the past as Kyle Juszczyk kind of guy. Well, we've seen the Red Cat in the past. It was successful early on last year. It kind of ran its course, but at the end of the day, it is another piece that you can add behind that offensive line, which is now weighing at an average weight of 331 pounds, the second heaviest in the SEC. That's going to be able to move some weight in in, in the upcoming season. So I'm, I, I'm of the belief that it can't be worse than last year, and as a result, uh, what was a top 20 scoring offense will eventually jump to top 10, potentially top five. Uh, but the, ultimately, it's going to come down to Quinn Ewers to make that jump and keep Texas scoring touchdowns rather than jogging off the field and seeing Burt Auburn and his luscious hair jog on. <laughs> uh, before we switch some gears and get into the running backs and uh, the Trey Wisner comment made today by Steve Sarkeesian and his availability after the seventh Longhorn practice. So let me tell you about our friends at Texas Electricity Ratings. Uh, on Texas football, of course, on Tuesday night, brought to you by Texas Electricity Ratings. And then we appreciate them so much. Uh, for those of y'all living in Texas, of course, and hopefully uh, you live in the great state. If you don't, you should get here as soon as you can, uh, especially in the deregulated cities like D Dallas and Houston. You understand the deregulated electricity market can be very confusing. Uh, Texas, uh, Texas Electricity Ratings is a shopping website. lets you compare prices, read customer reviews, and find a good electricity uh, provider that fits your needs. Also filters out the gimmicky plans, uh, websites like Power to Choose that trick you into expensive, expensive bills that you don't want to be a part of. So if you're in the market for a new electricity plan, certainly shop TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF. Uh, just put the on Texas football, you know, first letters there, OTF for all of your electricity needs. That's on, or excuse me, TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF. We appreciate them on a Tuesday night bringing you the live stream, talking Texas football. Seven practices in to the workouts, a couple, uh, couple two weeks out now to the – well, over two weeks to the spring game, which I think, guys, will be really, really competitive. Can't wait to be talking about that uh, before and after as we get uh, closer to April the 20th in that spring game. Uh, running backs, guys, I mean, that's uh, – and I want to – before we get into that, let's set it up with uh, what you heard from Sark today, uh, CJ, about Trey Weisner, that he was another guy. Singled out by Sark. Again, if you're just jumping on with us, uh, 40 minutes into the conversation, it was only about a 12 minute availability. Um, not a lot. There was a swim coach, you know, introduction and all that went on today. But uh, we're, we're picking the, the the highlights. And Trey Wisner was a guy I mentioned who's another running back in this deep running back room, which has become, gosh, the culture in that room, the uh, the depth in that room with uh, with what they do with the Shard Choice. Pretty incredible. What did you hear from Sark today about Trey Wisner? Yeah, it was more of the same of what we've heard from Sarkeesian about Trey Wisner so far this offseason. Uh, just a guy that 
is blue collar through and through. He's going to put his head down. He's going to work and he's going to earn a spot on the field. You've known this uh, his entire high school career, whether it was at Waco Connolly or DeSoto, this was a guy who had 200 rushing yards and 20 tackles in a playoff game at Connolly. And he was another guy that, you know, helped lead DeSoto to a state championship as well. So, uh, it, it's kind of been his MO all throughout his playing days is uh, he's going to outwork whoever he's next to, and he's going to set an example for whatever it takes for the rest of the team to get back to that level of play. And uh, again, I think recruiting, it kind of goes back to recruiting good players from good programs uh, that have seen what it's like to, to be successful on the field at the high school level. That translates. Trey Wisner today, essentially was called one of the hardest working players in the Texas program. And I don't think anybody who covered his recruitment would say that was a big surprise. You know, that's kind of who he is. And I think that's encouraging when you talk about that player led culture and that program that, you know, kind of revolves around being uh, led from within Trey Wisner is doing it uh, by example, and he's earning the respect of a number of guys in that Texas uh, locker room at the moment. Yeah. And that DeSoto program led by Claude Mathis and uh, covered Claude when he was at Southwest Texas as a running back way back in the day. But, uh, you know, it sounds like Byron Murphy, Rod, from the, the mm-hmm. offensive side, because Byron yeah. was not going to be outworked. He was not going to be – you're not going to find – and, of course, he's going to be drafted in the top 20 picks of this draft coming up in a few weeks. Who was that guy on your team? It probably was you at a lot of levels, but who were the guys that you, know, you just showed up and go, damn, that guy's here again. That guy – uh, is just grinding. Oh, it sounds like that's uh, that's just Trey Wisner. That was Byron Murphy before. Yeah, we had a we had a couple of guys like that. Um, Ahmad Brooks was like that, just a grinder. Um, I mean, guy was a starting corner at Texas. Had his job taken by uh, Quentin Jammer and myself. We end up starting, and he ended up starting at safety. He just went up, found a damn job. He's like, all right, I can't get a job at corner. I'll get a job somewhere else. Uh, one of those guys kind of earned everybody's respect just because of his attitude. Uh, was just a Wolverine. Um, another guy um, on offense, I'll, I'll go Hodges Mitchell. Man, love the way Hodges mm-hmm. Mitchell. Everybody remember Hodges Mitchell was a small dude back when they back when the Big Twelve was a running conference. They were still running triple option in the Big Twelve when the Big Twelve was a defensive running conference. That's what it was before Mike Leach got involved. And um, although my man uh, Hodges Mitchell was small, dude, he had a he had the heart of a lion. Guy was a workhorse. At five, whatever he was, five, seven, five, eight, uh, you know what I mean? About a, probably a 200, I don't know, maybe it was 205 pounds, 210, but a workhorse. I don't know what his dimensions were, but he was small, diminutive. Uh, and the guy was just a, you know, a bulldog. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rick, you remember my man, Hodges. Hodges Mitchell don't get enough love. I know a lot of great running backs at Texas, but I'll give a shout out to my man, Hodges Mitchell, man. He don't get enough love. But uh, going back to the, the current Texas team, yeah, I think Trey Wisner, I mean, kind of reminds me of a, the Hodges Mitchell. I mean, he is a smaller guy, but he was asked about whether uh, Trey Wisner could be in that Keelan Robinson role. Yeah. And Sark actually agreed. Sark said, yeah, I could see that. So uh, Sark's got something up his sleeve. He he came out and gave Trey Wisner a lot of love uh, unsolicited. You know, he just came out and gave him some love. And we know what he thinks of that running back room. He's on the record for saying the running back position is the most underutilized position in the passing game. So he likes to use that. I've heard, and and Jerry and Bobby Burden have also reported, it seems like more pony package may be coming. There may be more pony package out there coming, which is the two tailback sets last season and the season before that and the season before that. It was the most efficient, effective, and explosive personnel grouping they used with two tailbacks, even without Bijan and Rojo. And I think, hell, Longhorn fans remember it well. In the Sugar Bowl, if you continue running the pony package, hell, you might win that damn game. Because that's how you scored your first touchdown. This game was running that pony back, and then you stopped running it. I don't know why, but I digress. I don't want to get on that old stuff. But my point is, you got all these great running backs, and a way to keep them motivated and incentivized to stick around is simply, hey, I'll play more of y'all. And I wonder this this season if we'll see more of those two tailback sets. Now, when you had Bijan, Rojo, and Keelan Rock. Robinson, you use all three of those guys in the pony package. And now you got CJ, you got, um, you know, Jaden Blue, and maybe Trey Weisner is that other guy they throw out there, or it's say the unread, or it's both. Who knows? 
Yeah. Uh, CJ, how do you mean, gosh, we just talked about the depth of the wide receiver room. If you're putting an extra running back on the field, you're taking a receiver likely off the field. Uh, this is the competition. You can, take a tight end off. you can go 20. You can go 20 yeah. and take a tight end off and keep three wide receivers. Just, just saying. Just yeah, yeah. But it, uh, that, that's the competition that I think is, is really cool for the <laughs> football team. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, the, it's almost like a – you know, a uh, bag of toys for Sark. He can do a lot of different things to it, how the yeah. formations are. It's going to be a nightmare for, for defensive coordinators, you feel like. How do you see the running back room now, CJ and uh, Rod, you follow up? I mean, obviously, CJ Baxter returns to be the lead back. Jaden Blue is one of the most explosive, fastest running backs in the country. Beyond those two, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think you're going to see a nice little thunder and lightning between Blue and Baxter. I think Baxter is going to be your guy. And I, I don't think that's necessarily something that that's up for conversation as much as people would like it to be. Baxter is your number one guy. Uh, Blue will get, you know, a number of, of reps as well, uh, especially this fall, whenever you start worrying a little bit about the, the workload of your running backs. But yeah. uh Finding who that third piece to me is really important. Will it be a Trey Wisner? Can you rely on him to be running through the tackles, between the tackles? Uh, is Savion Red brought enough to his game to diversify what we know he is at the moment? That's a question. And are either of the two freshmen, Christian Clark or Jarrett Gibson, uh, up to speed enough to be relied upon in the SEC? Uh, the biggest thing for me is finding a guy that is willing to pass protect if you're yeah. the Texas Longhorns, if you're Tashard Choice, uh, and, and what that room could be. I think to me all depends on what they will do in the pass protecting game because that essentially is the overarching factor that gets them on the field. Yeah, you're a running back at the University of Texas. We know that you're talented with the ball in your hands. That's what got you here. We know that. What can you do when the ball is not in your hands to impact the game? That's what helped make Roshan Johnson so impactful during his time on campus was, yeah, I'm going to lower my hat. I'm going to show this guy across from me that, no, he's not going to touch my quarterback because I'm going to prevent him from doing so. Uh, I think Bijan was a little different because of how freakishly athletic he was in other assets of the game where his pass protection, though it got better, was never really a strength. But in a talented room like this where you see a lot of guys – uh, really trying to duke it out amongst each other to get extra reps and extra carries. It's going to start with who can be doing the extra pieces, and that starts with pass pro for me. Yep, that's a great point. I totally agree with that, CJ. The only thing I'll add is I do think CJ Baxter ends up being your leading rusher, knock on wood, that you know there are no significant injuries back there. Uh, but if there are, I think they're deep enough. Obviously, it's what we're talking about. Uh, they'll be fine with uh, some of the next man stepping up. But I think Jaden Blue is going to be featured in the passing game for them. Um, I think you might get more vertical routes downfield, more so than just the wheel routes downfield. Um, they may get him you know, lining up in the slot and running some of those uh, vertical routes downfield just – when he gets matched up on a linebacker or something like that, because yeah, his speed is, I mean, it's, it's a real threat. I mean, he's a guy that can take it to the house anytime he gets the ball in his hands. Uh, good stuff guys talking about running backs and, and they're deep. I mean, they got the two freshmen coming in Gibson and Clark. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a deep, deep room right now. Uh, and that's going to be fun to watch. And that's, that's kind of say that across the board right now with this Texas yep. football yep. team. And uh, that's why they're going one, two, threes, and fours. That's why the spring game, I think, is going to be really, really competitive coming up on April 20th here on our On Texas Football Tuesday live stream brought to you by Texas Electricity Ratings. CJ, mm -hmm. one other note from Sark today. He did was asked about Quinn and his availability last week where Quinn talked about slowing down, kind of smelling the roses a little bit. Uh, maybe he's a little, you know, running as fast as he could to get to the NFL for a while. Uh, and he said, he said, quote, I think Quinn's really enjoying his time right now. That's how you should be in year three. Let me ask you a two-part question. One on, you know, his thoughts on Quinn and where what you heard from Quinn last week. And then, you know, I, I think the headset communication is going to be really big for Texas this year. We're talking about all this offensive weaponry. And Quinn talked last week about being able to talk to coach in real time. Uh, those two things and, and what that can mean for this Texas offense in 2024. Yeah, I think that's kind of also been a, a nice little recurring theme that can, you know, certainly – give you optimism and hope about what Quinn can turn into, right? Like you talked about it a little bit there, E, just kind of the approach from Quinn, whether it be skipping his senior season, jumping straight to Ohio State, uh, transferring to Texas and, you know, kind of looking back 
now after two seasons and saying, you know what, I've, I've done this pretty quickly. You know, I've maybe not given myself the full opportunity to develop at a position, which takes a whole lot of time. You look at some of the best quarterbacks in the game right now and how quickly they were able to get see success. Well, for a lot of them, it wasn't very quick. You know, Aaron Rodgers sat, Jordan Love sat, Patrick Mahomes did not play his rookie year. Uh, even Brock Purdy, who you can make the argument for Brock Purdy, whatever, he came in around week 14 before it was really his turn to get up to speed with the game. And I think that was something that lacked a little bit with Quinn Ewers early in his college career. Again, he was hopping on the field very early uh, with a lot of expectations, essentially not having played football for, you know, a year and a half or two years. So to me, I think right now you're looking at a Quinn Ewers that is understanding where he is in his you know, maturation process, where he is in his game. And he's certainly feeling and looking a lot more comfortable and confident on the field and off the field. You know, we, we were able to see Quinn crack a couple jokes. Uh, he smiled a little bit more with us today rather than what we've seen from him uh, in the past. So I, I like what I've seen so far, and I'm going to continue to beat the drum that you're going to see a continual step on that ladder to what you hope to see from Quinn Ewers. And that starts this spring and it will carry on to the field in year three. Agreed. Roger, thoughts on yeah. that whole thing? I yeah. mean, uh, Quinn is, I mean, you know, he's re almost racing to the NFL. And as uh, CJ pointed out, that's not the way it works. I mean, you, it's, you got to take your time. You got to buy, you got to take your lumps. And it's, it was kind of refreshing mm -hmm. for me to hear him say that. And I wonder how much Arch Manning rubs off on him a little bit because Arch is the mm -hmm. one that everyone talks about. But even Arch is like, you know what? Just have Patient. a good time. Just, yeah. just have a good time. Just enjoy college. It, yeah. You only get one chance to go to college and enjoy it. You didn't get your senior year of high school and all that. I mean, that's you're kind of hearing me as, as CJ said. You're looking, you read between the lines. Quinn's like, man, maybe I was going too fast at one point. We've all done it at, at you know at points of our life. Uh, but you know, this is this is important. He's gonna have a lot of pressure on him this year, a lot of spotlight uh, for Texas. But it does feel like he's in a good place. Uh, no, I, I I love the quote uh, from my old DB coach uh, who said. You know, life and football are both constant struggles deciding between what you want to be and what you need to be in order to survive. Yeah. Um, and I know was I know what Quinn wanted to be. He wanted to be on the fast track to the NFL, <clears throat> you know, stop here, stop there, light, light it up at Texas, and then boom, be the first quarterback taken. That's what he's always dreamed of. And he was on that fast track for a while. And I think now the maturity he has realized – now, you know, that's what he wanted, but what he needs actually right now is to slow it down, be more in the moment, be present, you know, learn how to cultivate his leadership skill. Jerry Hamilton brought up a great point that, you know, when you miss that senior year, uh, you know, not only did he miss a year of development on the field, but he also missed that year of being a senior leader. Right. And everybody knows being a senior leader, you feel like you have ownership, like you feel like you have you're empowered. Right. Because it's your team in your last year and in a in a place, you know, especially where he played football. So like Carol, he's also a community leader, too. So he's a community leader and their expectations would be in a community leader and being the face of that football program. Um, and now at Texas, although it's a much bigger stage, a much bigger community, a much bigger program, it would it probably would have helped his maturity as a leader if he had that senior year at South Lake Carroll and was able to cultivate his leadership style, um, how to be confrontational, how to address, um, you know, holding players accountable, holding your peers accountable. All that. I'm sure he did all that stuff, but it is different as a senior leader when it's your team. And as South Lake Carroll, I'm sure that program, they got a lot of great leaders they cultivate. But when it's your turn, um, there's a different responsibility to it, a different burden. And I think now he has that burden and responsibility. And you have to, if you're a guy like Quinn, you know, you have to make sure, like he said, he said, I want to make sure I'm present. Because there are a lot of people tugging at him, right? Fans want some of his time. NIL, uh, coach wants a lot of your time. Players in the locker room, there are new players. They're a new receiving core. They all want to get to know their quarterback. They want to hang out with the QB. I, I had a QB that was my best friend. The receivers are always hanging out with him. They're always kicking it. So they always going to go to lunch and kick it. They want to go uh, hang out. They want to go talk ball. They want to play the video game. There's a lot of demand on him right now. And you got to make sure you're present for all of it to make sure you give everybody, you know, their the right energy and the, you know, I mean, the proper energy. 
And I think now he's learning that. And that's that's gonna be part of the lessons you learn when you go to league. You're gonna you're gonna be in the face of a franchise, you're gonna be in the face of a high school program, be in the face of University of Texas, be in the face of a franchise where the billionaire decides, Yeah, hey, I want to invest in you. I'm gonna invest a lot of money in you, hundreds of millions of dollars, because I believe you can be the quarterback that can win us a Super Bowl. I mean, that's he's gonna be in that conversation. So these little small details about leadership and about accountability, they matter. Character, it matters, especially when you're talking about a guy who's going to lead an entire franchise and inspire a locker room of men. And, you know, vocal leadership wasn't a strength for him. Well, it's got to be if you're going to be an NFL franchise quarterback, it better be. Can't yeah. be, you know, they don't want they don't want someone who's meek and, uh, you know, someone who's uh, soft spoken. No, man, you're the quarterback of the team. You're the guy. All right. Yeah. So put the cape on and and let's go to work. So I, I I think that's part of that process. And I can't wait to see him. I think he's going to be great, by the way. I'm not saying this. I don't think he's, I think he's going to be amazing in that role. But that is a new role for him. Yeah, no, I think uh, to Jerry's point, your point, Rod, I've said it. I mean, that's he missed that as a senior at South Lake Carroll, CJ. I mean, there's there's a lot to that, <laughs> I believe. And he's because you, know, you you leave in as a junior, which you should be a you know junior, a senior in high school after your junior year. And you get to a Columbus and you're just sitting. I mean, you're not, you're listening. You're not yep. leading. You're, all you're doing is absorbing and, and trying to be a part of what it is, whatever the NIL dollars he made. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you miss that as a senior leader at, at uh, South Lake Carroll. This is his real, and we know with the last couple of years, it was Bijan and Rojo's team. It was, you know, the, the leaders who were moving on last year. And this is his chance to take it and seize it and be that. And, you know, there are different types of leadership. We know that. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of, of the late, great Augie Garrido used to talk about all the time, respect the game. The game's mm-hmm. bigger than you. Respect the game. And it's yep. almost like Quinn's starting to realize that, you know, respect this game. Uh, I, I'll get there. The game's always going to be there. The league's always going to be there. That's why I wonder mm-hmm. about uh, Arch, because that's kind of the Arch mindset that he's learned it from his uncles. He's learned it from his, his grandfather. You know, the, the NFL is always going to be there. Respect the game. Learn the game but enjoy the, the process as it's happening. That was always Augie's biggest deal. The, yep. the process will lead to the success that you seek, uh, but but trust the game, respect the game, and uh, put in the time, and you'll get where you want to be if you have the talent to get there. Yeah, it to me, obviously, finding that fine line of being your friend, being – you know, your homie off the field, kind of understanding what it's like to, you know, mm-hmm. kind of rub elbows with everybody on the team, but still be the quarterback and the leader and the d- disciplinarian as the, you know, basically the captain on the field is always interesting as a quarterback. You know, uh, it, you don't necessarily make a lot of friends when you're the quarterback unless you are, you know, a Tom Brady. You know, that's kind mm-hmm. of how it goes. So you, and even then, if you were to ask anybody in that Patriots locker room back at the day, You'd probably say, yeah, Tom Brady's the biggest asshole on our team, aside from Bill (laughs) Belichick. That's just the standard in which he, you know, kind of demanded from everybody else on his team. Uh, I I love the story Tom Brady tells with uh, uh, Julian Edelman all the time. You know, it's I I hated him on the field at first. I could not stand throwing the rock to Julian Edelman when he was uh, first or second year guy on the team. And why was that? Well, he would run his routes at 12 instead of 11, or he would cut at seven instead of six. You know, it was the little things that Tom Brady demanded of himself and his team that essentially, you know, led allowed them to have the, the greatest dynasty in NFL history. So uh, for me and for Quinn, you know, are you still going to have, you know, that level of, yeah, if you're going to be successful with me, I'm going to demand stuff from you. You know, that's kind of where I'm at with Quinn too, because I want to see that. We saw a little bit of it last year. Uh, I don't think the cameras caught all of it a lot last year, but there were times last year where, you know, you'd kind of see him, you know, kind of barking at an offensive lineman. Maybe the snaps were low. Maybe, uh, you know, your tackle wasn't necessarily, you know, cutting or or getting to his guy on the edge, whatever it is. Maybe a route wasn't run the, the right way. There were times he kind of showed that bark. But again, you're the quarterback at the University of Texas coming off of a year in which you were a college football playoff, you know, uh, attendee, that standard is going to be there. Can you elevate your team and can you continually bring that juice to practice every day? Because, and I, I hate to even bring it up, but I know that next year it's not going to be an issue. It's not going to be a talking point, but uh, that's that next step for Quinn. And I'm, I'm guaranteeing that we see more of a step 
this year than what we've seen at any point uh, during Quinn Ewers' tenure as a Longhorn. Yeah, not agree, man, because I think there's a void of that uh, on the offensive side, especially like Kelvin Banks and, you know, who are your leaders? I mean, that you, that there's with all the guys moving off to the NFL, they're, they, they need it. They need someone to be that guy. And, you know, Rod, you know this, having covered it, and, you, you know, you were gone when Vince was there and leading the way, but Vince was a dick. I mean, Vince was a guy. You know, Vince yeah. would hold people accountable. And, you know, I, you know, not to compare Quinn to Vince, but at the same time, that's the expectation. Go play mm-hmm. for a national championship and Vince – patrolled the locker room. He, I mean, he made sure uh, that everybody was, you know, you know, Mac let him have his good time, let him have fun, let him be Vince. But he all, he also controlled and corralled everything to make sure everybody was doing what needed to be done to be a national champion. Yep. There's no doubt. And I, I guess I think Quinn, Quinn understands that he understands that the quarterback is a natural leadership position. And, you know, the last season, there was a lot of um, supportive leadership um, for him not as much this season. Um, there still will be leadership in different position groups um, to, for them to rely on. So you'll have your leadership council. But it, this is Quinn's team. This is truly – last year it didn't feel like that. Um, you know, last year I think it was, you know, that you had Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat made the best D-tackle duo out there. You had Jalen Ford, who was a fantastic leader that we all kind of took for granted out there too. Uh, You know, JT Sanders was a great leader who always really uh, held his teammates accountable. Even Xavier Worthy had his own leadership style, kind of leading by example. Christian Jones, one of those guys who had been through it, right? Fifth year senior, so he was a great leader. So you have some of that now, but I think it is clear this is Quinn's team. And Quinn needs to be the guy that, um, you know, embraces that role, em- embrace it. Because they, they're going to look to him. Scouts want to see that, too, at the next level. They're going to ask when they go interview uh, teammates, interview coaches about Quinn's leadership style. They're going to want to know, all right, does he does he got that dog in him? All right. Is he hey, is he a guy that can lead? Is he can he be the the, the, the leader of the pack? Can he can he be the, the the leader of the pack of wolves? All right, we got a bunch of hungry dogs out there. Can he be the guy that leads that group? Can he be the alpha among a group of alpha males? Because that's what happens in a locker room. And sometimes guys they don't have that uh that that gene, right? They don't have that trait. And we've seen it. You can have the athletic ability. Look at a, a Carson Wentz for that matter. Guys like that, a guy who couldn't stay healthy, and a guy who didn't have that dog in him. And yeah. they brought in some, they brought in a dog. And Jalen Hurst was like, hey, hey, we want him. Locker room was like, we choose. The locker room will vote, guys. I've been a part of a quarterback controversy. It's just an election. You ran a new quarterback in there, and everybody goes, I vote for him. I think he gives us the best chance to win. And that's, you know, essentially, they mostly are voting for that dog. Who got that dog in him? Um, and I think for, for Quinn, he's got it in him. He's got to show that he's got that dog in him sometimes. Sometimes that dog needs to bark. Sometimes that dog needs to bite. It's all right. You know what I mean? He'll figure that out. That's part of whatever his leadership style is. But in the NFL, yeah, man, you've got that's part of it. That part, part of that pedigree. Physically, he's got everything. That he's coming back to school to refine um, you know, some of those things like getting deep into the progressions, feeling the pressure and not seeing it. Um, you know, being able, I think, to be more effective in places like the red zone, right? I mean, so he's got some little things he's got to work on, staying healthy through an entire football season. But I think that'll come. I think that's the easy part for Quinn. I think the other part will be embracing the role of being a a leader, which is something he admittedly is uncomfortable in. That he liked to be in, uh, um, you know, in in a, in a more supportive role. And it's like, no, not this season. Maybe when you get to the NFL for your first couple of years, but not this season, Quinn, we need you to be that big dog. Yeah. A big dog, big dog energy. Got a big, big energy. dog energy. <laughs> big dog energy. Big dog. Uh, all right. So, uh, UT boy, appreciate the uh, super chat. Roderick, uh, which you were Roderick until they hey. changed the run out of the blue. If Montreal Flowers stayed healthy, was he a star in the making? Oh, man. I mean, you talk about speed. I mean, we look at Xavier Worthy now and admire his speed. I, I want to say, my man, I got. I forget uh, the Montreal Flowers 100 meter time. I want to say that it was something freakish, man. It was under a, a 10-5 or something like that. I mean, it was sub 10-5. He was a freak uh, speed-wise. Uh, as a as a receiver, I, I think he was more of a, a track guy playing football. I definitely think if he didn't get hurt, he'd have got, he'd have got a shot in the NFL. There's no question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, he was the fastest guy on the team, I believe, at the time, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think there was anybody on the team that was faster <laughs> than Montreal Flowers. 
at the time. So, yeah, I mean, he'd had time to refine his craft and, you know, work on his route running, things like that. I do think uh, my man Montreal had an NFL future. Um, I got to go research what kind of time he ran, but it was something freakish. I mean, at the time, I think he was the fastest guy on the team. He was our, our version of Xavier Worthy. Yep. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Thank you, T Boy. That's great. And uh, let me tell you one more time about our great sponsor tonight and our partners at Texas Electricity Ratings, because it's why we're here and they're the best. If you are living in Texas and especially one of the major cities that is deregulated with electricity, like Dallas and Houston and many others, you understand that deregulated electricity market can be confusing, right? It's it's a great option. It's something a lot of people would like to have, uh, but you want to make sure you're doing it right. And that's what Texas Electricity Ratings is all about. It's a shopping website. Let's you compare prices, read customer reviews, actual customer reviews, not just, uh, you know, the <laughs> made up things. These are actual people. You also find a good electricity that fits your needs. Also filters out the gimmicky plans that you don't want to be a part of. There are websites like Power to Choose that trick you into things you don't want to be a part of. Uh, don't mess with that. It is a, a simple uh, go, go forward spot. Uh, and that's TexasElectricityRatings.com uh, to get the best spot for you in the deregulated areas of Texas. If you're in the market. Uh, make sure you check it out. Make sure you uh, uh, put TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF, OTF when you log in. That'll uh, let you know that you found it right here on, on Texas football on the live stream on a Tuesday night. TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF for all of your electricity needs. And we appreciate them on a Tuesday night. Good conversations tonight, guys. Uh, talking SART, availability, seven practices in, running backs, ride receivers, portal, culture, quarterback. All important things as we continue to count down the days to the spring game, April 20th. Let me ask you guys, we wrap this thing up. Could change by next Tuesday, but what's the number one matchup you're looking forward to seeing in the spring game? CJ. Ooh. Head to that's head. A good one. I'm gonna see uh I want to see Trey Moore. I want to see him go up against Calvin Banks and Cam Williams. Uh just yeah. to get an idea of how quick he is, you know. Uh, ESPN had him, we talked about this on the winning drive yesterday, had him as the number three edge rusher in the country coming into this year. So a uh, pretty high praise. If you can live up to that billing, it changes the entire trajectory of this Texas defense. When you compare or when you add him to a defense that already has Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke and, and now Colin Simmons. So Trey Moore and those uh, Texas tackles. Rod B, I think I know where you go on this. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's easy for me. I'm going to go Texas DBs, uh, the corner specifically going up against those wide receivers. I want to see that matchup because the pass defense for Texas has been uh, a it, it's been subpar. Now I'll be make sure I get my words right. It's been subpar the last couple of years. It has not been a strength for Texas. Sark was asked about it in the media availability today. Hey, UT boy. Hey, I appreciate that, baby. Hey, that's love. That's love. Hey, and by the way, uh, my man Montreal ran a 10 4 6, I believe, 100 meters. <laughs> he was moving. He was moving. Um, but yeah, thank you, YouTube boy. I think that's very kind. Very kind of you, man. Uh, we appreciate that. That's family. Uh, but yeah, I want to see them UTDBs, but I want to see them match up against this really, really deep uh, wide receiving core. They got a lot of guys that have uh, versatility. Um, so a lot of different weapons in the wide receiving core. I want to see them test this defensive backfield for Texas. And, you know, see if they can improve on the, the, the issues that really plagued them all last season and the season before that, you know, leverage issues. Uh, can they play more press man? If they do play more press man, can they defend the deep ball? Because that's what they did against um, you know, Tech and Oklahoma State and Washington. You know, they played more press man late in the season, but against Oklahoma State and against Washington, they gave up the deep ball playing more press man. So I'd rather you be off if you're going to give the D ball. So it, Sark said, remember in, in that uh, media availability, he said, we want to take away the early down uh, passes. That's essentially what he said. I'm paraphrasing, but he's, he's talking about the early down passes. And I believe what he's talking about essentially is them giving up those easy inside quick game throws. And late in the season, like I said, they played more bump and run coverage on the field and the boundary side to take that away, which they did. They took away the inside cuts. They took away the quick game. But Kim Kardashian, Nicki Minaj, Serena Williams, Oscar, Cardi B size, Megan the size, but they gave up the deep ball to Oklahoma State. They gave the deep ball to Washington. So they got to figure that out. And I want to see if they have figured that out technique-wise with their fundamentals this spring, how to play more press, take away the easy completions, but also safeguard yourself against the deep ball, which essentially is why you got beat. One of the reasons you got beat against Washington. Well, you know, I think those last couple conversations are going to be important. You get great quarterback play with leadership, 
can rush the passer and get pressure and cover better, mm -hmm. this team, the sky's the limit for what yep. they can be in 2024. Guys, great stuff. Thank you to Texas Electricity Ratings. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Rod. I know coffee and football will be on 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. The conversation never stops here on the On Texas Football YouTube channel and conversation. Thanks for everybody that weighed in and the uh, super chats, the questions. It's been fun. Uh, looking forward to a fun week. And uh, as we say, counting down the days to the spring game, April the 20th. The coverage doesn't stop here on On Texas Football. Guys, appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Good stuff. All right, man. Absolutely. Thank PJ, you. appreciate you too. Rod, awesome. Uh, kiss that baby, and we'll uh, see you all next Tuesday and certainly see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, coffee and football on On Texas Football. Welcome.